I, I heard something not that long ago, and it made me think. It was the idea of how we measure our lives. We so often measure our lives in units of time, days, weeks, months, years. And this article talked about, instead of doing that, measure your life in terms of events. And so I began to think about that, and one thing that popped into my mind was presidential elections. How many presidential elections do I have left? If the average American, their lifespan is about 80, so that's what I'm basing this on. At 80 years old, I will experience 20 presidential elections. I know it seems like they're happening every year, but they only happen every four, which means that I have already gone through 11 presidential elections. It means this. I've got nine left. And after 2020, I'm down to eight. Thank God. (laughs) Then I thought in terms of what about reading? I I like to read. I read a lot. But the average American, and it's hard to get an exact number on this, but the average American reads about five books a year. So if you live to 80, that's 400 books you'll read. Well, I'm 45. That means out of my 400 allotted books, I have already read 225. So it looks like this. I've only got 175 books left. Man, I better think smart about what time I invest in reading and which books I invest in reading. Then I thought, well, the holiday season is upon us. If you live to be 80, you get 80 Christmases. That means for me, I've already done 44 Christmases. I'm about to do 45. I've got 36 Christmases left. 36. That's not many. Then I thought, Let's really get into the the practical. Let's get into the personal. What about time with people? So I thought about my parents. If both of my parents live to 80, they've got, I'm rounding down, but about 10 years left. If they live to 80, I've got 10 years left with them. If I spend optimistically 10 days a year with them, that's not that many days It's about 100. So then I started thinking, how many days have I spent with them? Do you know that growing up, from the time you're born to about 18, you spend about 95% of your days, if you're fortunate and your parents are married and you're living in the house with them, they don't get divorced, you spend about 95% of your days with your parents from birth through age 18. That is about 6,200 days. If after that, If after you turn 18, you average 10 days a year with your parents, it means you have 620 days left. It means in the first 18 years, you have spent 90% of the time you're going to spend with your parents. It's, it's, It's already done. So for me, at age 45, if I've got 10 years left with my mom and dad, and I spend 10 days a year with each of them, It means I've got less than 2% of my time with my parents left. It would look like this. And I know that looks like a whole lot of red, but there are some unchecked off ones. Way, way, way at the left edge. Less than 2% of my time. When you start measuring life by events, it makes you think about it differently. So we've been in this series called Better. Better. And the whole idea behind this series is this, that life gets better when life gets simple. Life gets better when we learn how to simplify, when we remove the extraneous. And it starts with the pace of our life. That's what we talked about in week one. In week one, that we need to slow down, that you change the pace of your life by practicing the Sabbath, by establishing a day, 24 hours a week, that's different. It's set aside. You don't do work. You do things that revive your soul, that that bring life into you. You set time aside for God. Practice the Sabbath. It changes the pace of your life. Then the second week, we talked about priorities. And we said, make the important a priority by finding balance. Balance in five main areas and not giving each one the same, but saying, in this time, in this season of my life, how do I balance those things out? 
And then last week we took that further and we talked about the, uh, the idea of choosing where your time goes based on God's plan for your life now. Because there's chosen time and there's unchosen time. And unchosen time gets lost. It gets commandeered by others. It's, it's not invested wisely. We need to choose where our time goes based on what God's plan for your life is now. And God's plan changes based on the season of life you're in, based on what's happening around you. So you need to invest your time wisely, which means this, this is what we talked about last week. You cannot live a better life without saying no to good things. You've got to say no to good things so you could say yes to God's plan for your life. So you could say yes to the best things. So in all of this, there are two realities that make life super complex. If we say life gets better when life gets simple, there's two things that add complexity to our life. People and property. People and property. When I say property, it's our possessions, it's our finances, it's those material things that come into our life. So next week, we're going to talk about property. This morning, we're going to talk about people because people don't make life simple. People make life complex. They bring complexity into your life because of their demands, their expectations, because of their hurts, their disappointments, because of miscommunication. People add a level of complexity all the time. So how do we How do we be intentional in how we invest our time? When we go back to that, think about that graphic. How much time do you have left with your parents? How much time do you have left with those people? Why is it so hard to capitalize on that time? Because people bring complexity. But what I've learned is this, that you need to spend time now with those you will wish you had spent time more with later. Spent more time with later. You're going to spend it now. Gerald Heatwall, one of the elders here, his, his mom step from this world into the eternal world on Thursday morning. There's no more time to spend with mom. Spend time now with those that you wish you would have spent more time with later. The reason it's hard is because people bring complexity. And so it's easier to say, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. I don't want to deal with that person. They make life complex, so we don't do it. But spend time now with those you will wish you had spent more time with later. So here's a practical way to do this. And this is my challenge to you. Go home today and write down five to ten names. Name them. Don't just put generic, my kids. Your kids have names, I hope. Like Kate said, it's an experiment. Maybe you're just like, (laughs) I'll make up a name. Uh, Name them. Don't just say, I want to spend time with my spouse. Write your spouse's name down. Don't just say, your parents, write their names. Don't just say, write down. Say, these are the people I'm going to intentionally carve out time to invest in now. Right now, in this time, in this season of my life. Because it will change. You'll move. They'll move. You don't have to, you're not going to be able to invest that time. Someone dies, you're not going to be able to invest that time. But in this moment, in this season, who are those five to ten people you're going to intentionally say, I'm going to invest in? Some of the people I do that with outside of my immediate family are the leadership team here at the church. I meet one-on-one. I I try to. It doesn't happen every month, but I try to meet one-on-one with the leaders of the church once a month. That's an investment of my time, but it's worth it because they, they are huge. They are important to what we're doing here. So write out those names and then say, now, I'm going to put those names on the calendar. I'm going to carve out time. I'm going to do this. The reason we don't like to take the time to do that is because people are complex. So you you make time, you make an appointment, and you have to deal with things, and we don't want to deal with things. People add complexity. They don't remove it. So I want to give a list of some things, and I want to ask you, do these things make life better? These are the people problems. See, life would be better if we can just get rid of all the people stuff. I mean, life would be simple. If I didn't have to argue with anyone except myself, it'd be fine. The problem is my wife and I disagree sometimes, unlike everything. Uh, I have learned that she's always right. It just takes me a while to realize that, you know. I, I start with she's wrong, and then eventually I realize that she was right all along. So I want to give you a list of some, um, some uh, words that add tension, maybe, to our relational lives. Here's the first one. Conflict. When you're in conflict with someone, is life better or is it more complex? Here's another. 
Disagreement. When you disagree with someone, is life smooth or does it add layers upon layers? What about this? Expectations, especially unfair or unstated expectations. What someone expects you to do, how they expect you to react, where they expect you to be, what they expect you to feel, how they expect you to respond. Do people's expectations make life better or more complex? Here's another. Offense. Offense. Someone who's just offended. They seem to be offended about everything, and they carry this offense, and they don't want to deal with it. So they walk around carrying an offense, and when people carry an offense, is life better or is life more complex? What about this one? Guarded. Someone who never seems to really share what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Everything's fine. It's no problem. Everything's good. It's all good. It's fine. And you're left guessing because you know you can see the steam coming out of their ears. You know something's a matter, and you're having to guess what is it that's bothering them now, today, Because they're so guarded, they won't share. Who thinks those things make life better? Who thinks those things make life more complex? I think most of us would say that makes life more complex. What would make life better? What about this? Instead of conflict, what if there was peace? What if we learned how to live in harmony with each other? We worked through the conflict to find resolution. What about instead of disagreement, there was understanding that somehow or other you could communicate and that person that you have that uh, disagreement with can understand you. You still may disagree, but they'd understand your heart and you'd understand their heart and you'd have a better understanding of each other even if you don't see eye to eye. What about instead of unfair expectations, there was sensitivity. Sensitivity to what is a justified expectation. Sensitivity to what you can and can't expect from someone and when you can expect it. What if there was a fair level of sensitivity, husband to wife and wife to husband? What about instead of offense, there was forgiveness? What if we were willing to say, let me come into this situation and say I'm sorry. Let me go into this situation and ask your forgiveness. What if there was a free flow of forgiveness instead of walking around being offended constantly? Or what about this? Instead of guarded, there was candidness. There was open, honest sharing of what it is that's bothering you, knowing that it may cause some ruffles, it may cause some ripples. But if we deal with it, if I can share open and honestly, we can move forward. Let me ask you, which of these two lists would make life better? The reason we don't get to the second list is because we don't want to spend time with people in the first list And so we don't deal with it. And life gets tense. Life gets full of turmoil. Life doesn't get better. It gets more complex. So we need to deal with these things. And we need to look at what the Bible teaches us about how to deal with these things. But before we look at what the Bible says, I want to look at probably four ways in which we typically deal with these things. Instead of finding peace, understanding, sensitivity, forgiveness, and candidness, what are, what are some of the ways we typically handle the people stuff? And please hear me. The people stuff aren't always big things. It's not always the big blowouts. It's not always husband and wife marital strife. It's not always parent to child tension. Sometimes it's the small things. But the Bible says it's the small things that sometimes make life sour. So it could be something like this. The person who impinges upon your time because they don't understand that your door isn't actually always opened. They decide they want to visit you, and so they stop by unannounced, uninvited, not, not calling ahead of time. They pop in and want to sit and have coffee for 75 hours, and you're, you're not up for that. And it adds complexity to your, to your life, but you don't know how to handle it, so you sit there and you drink the coffee, wishing the whole time you could throw it in their face. How do we deal with that? You live in a neighborhood, and there's that one family that lives down the road, and you like the parents. The parents are are nice. You like the husband and wife. The problem is the kids are demons. So you don't want to have the parents over, because when the parents show up, they bring their little demons. But then the parents just pop by and bring their kids with them, and your kids are now hanging out with their kids, and when their kids leave, your kids are demons. And you're going, I don't like this. How do we deal with that stuff? How do we typically deal with that stuff? Here's a few ways. The first is by stuffing. We, we just stuff it. We stuff it. We just ignore it. 
We, I, I'll just let it wait. It'll smooth over. If I just wait long enough, I'll eventually forget what it was that bothered me. The problem with stuffing is it actually never resolves the issue. It never deals with the problem. And so what happens is it becomes like an untreated wound. You, you don't get better. It gets infected. It gets worse. It gets more painful. And every time that thing comes up, that tension is revisited, it's more intense, and it's more intense, and it's more intense. So stuffing doesn't work, but it's what so many of us do. We just stuff it. Your motto is no problem. Everything's fine. But a lot of things aren't fine. Here's another one. Giving the cold shoulder. You don't stuff. Oh, you make everyone aware that there's something a matter. But you don't say anything about it. You are the silent assassin. You don't say anything. You don't do anything. But everybody knows there's a problem. So while the person who stuffs says, oh, there's nothing wrong, the person who gives the cold shoulder says, I don't have a problem, do you? They're, you're passive aggressive. You're the poster boy for past, passive aggressive behavior. I don't have a problem. If I had a problem, I'd tell you I had a problem. You want to go watch the game? Not with you, but I don't have a problem. I'll go with him, but not with you. Okay. Listen, we see this on social media. There's so many people who live like this. I've seen posts. You've seen posts. Somebody who put something along the lines of, I can't believe that some people would. Oh, we all know who that some people is. But you don't say their name. But yeah, I don't have a problem with them because I'm just talking in general, generic terms. We live in this passive-aggressive, giving the cold shoulder world. Here's another one. Running. A lot of times we handle things by running. We run from relationship to relationship, job to job, neighborhood to neighborhood, community to community, church to church. I see it all the time. I know people that have left a trail of jobs behind them because they won't deal with relational stuff. They go somewhere, they get hired, it's the greatest job they're going to ever have, they're telling everybody about it, and they're there for 37 seconds, and somebody ticks them off, and the job's the worst, the people are the worst, they're all imbeciles, and they can't wait to leave. Now here's the problem, you can run, you can run from job to job, church to church, neighborhood to neighborhood, marriage to marriage, but I'm telling you, you're going to always run into relational tension, because where there's people, there's complexity, and there'll always be relational tension. And if for no other reason that you're there, remember, what's the common denominator in all those jobs, all those neighborhoods, all those churches, all those relationships? You, you're, the, you're part of the issue, and you're going with you wherever you go. So you can run, and you can run, and you can run, but you never deal with the issues. Here's the last one, exploding. You simply explode. It's like the person's a ticking time bomb. You're just waiting and waiting. And you've been around people like this, haven't you? They're, they're like, it's like you're walking on eggshells around them. They're almost looking for something to be upset about. Everything's fine. Everything's good. And all of a sudden, they blow up. And oftentimes, the blow up is out of proportion to what happened. But it's because they haven't dealt with anything. They've stuffed. They've given the cold shoulder. They've run. And then finally, everything comes out, and they explode. And you're going, what's the matter? And the words are hurtful, and the behavior is hurtful, and the actions are hurtful. And they explode. And there's no calming the person down. All you can do is step away from the person, let them go off their rocker. They finally cool down. They isolate themselves. They finally cool down. And what do they say when you go back now and confront them? Well, what's the problem? I mean, it wasn't that bad. They are so out of touch with who they are, with what's going on inside of them, that they just explode. That's how we often handle things. But the problem is none of those work. And I would, I would guarantee you, all of us are at least one of those. Most of us are all of them at different times, depending on the situation. And some of us are all of them all the time. We stuff, give the cold shoulder, we run, then we explode, and we just keep this ongoing cycle. But there's a better way to deal with conflict. There's a better way to deal with people. There's a better way to deal with relational tension so that we can spend the time with those now that we're going to wish we had spent the time with later. And the Bible gives some clear steps on how to do that. 
Whatever the tension is, it can be big tension, it can be small tension, but there will be relational tension. It can be in your personal life, it can be in your work life. God gives clear instruction on how to deal with that. It could be in your community, it could be in your church, it could be in your neighborhood. So there's, there's eight steps, and we're going to go through them quickly. The first one is this, go directly. Go directly to the person. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need someone to intercede for you. You don't need to wait for permission. Just go. Here's how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 5. If you're offering your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Go directly. Go directly. The Bible makes it clear. The best way to handle issues in a relationship are to go directly, go quickly, go immediately, go right to that person. Say, hey, let's, let's talk about this. If you remember your brother has something against you, go and deal with it. That's the first step. Here's the next step. Go privately. Go privately. Now, a lot of us don't like to go privately, a lot of us don't like to go directly because going directly and going privately means confrontation. And we don't like confrontation. We don't want to deal with confrontation. Well, there are some of us who like to confront people. We like to tell them what they did wrong, why, why they're uh, an idiot. We like to tell them all the things that we know are right and they're wrong. But I'm not talking about that kind of confrontation. I'm talking about productive com- uh, confrontation. Confrontation that fixes things. And if you go directly and go privately, I'm telling you, it's going to produce confrontation. And we want to avoid that like the plague. But here's what Jesus says again in Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. Wait, I don't share it on Facebook first? No. Just between the two of you. You mean I don't share it with my small group first? No. Just between the two of you. You mean I don't... Just unload on the person that's my confidant and my counselor and somebody that I can confide in. No, go between the two of you. If he listens to you, to you, you have won your brother over. The first reason we don't like to do that is confrontation. The second reason is most of the time we don't we don't want to keep it to ourselves. We just want to get it off our chest. And the quickest, easiest way to get it off your chest is to tell someone else. Someone who will put their arm around you and say, oh, I understand. Yes, they did you wrong. We want want someone to, to feel our pain, to tell us we're justified, and to realize just what a jerk that other person is. Yes, they're a jerk. You're right. I don't know how you could ever have been treated like that. That's why we don't like to do it, because then we feel better. We got it off our chest. The problem is you only feel better for a a moment. You only feel better for a season. You only feel better for a little while. And then it builds back up, because you've never really dealt with it. So go directly, go privately. Listen, I have had people come to me. I've had people come to me at different times in my life and say, well, so-and-so has got an issue with you. So-and-so is mad at you. So-and-so is not happy. And I'm thinking, why do you know what so-and-so is not happy about? Why do you know what so-and-so is angry? Why do, you, why do you know any of those things? Why didn't so-and-so come to me? Now, go back to Matthew 5. If you realize your brother has something against you, go to him. So now I'm not off the hook. I can't say, well, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Now I don't have to do what I'm supposed to do. No, now I have a responsibility. My brother's got something against me. My sister's got something against me. My friend's got something against me. I'm going to go to them. But before you go to somebody else and have an intermediary, you go directly. Practice Matthew 18. Make Matthew 18 a verb. Do Matthew 18. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm really upset with, whoa, hold on. Let me ask you a question first. Have you done Matthew 18? Have you gone to that person? Have you gone directly? Have you gone personally? Have you gone privately? No, well, then don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. I don't need to hear it. Go. Go and talk to that person. If after you've gone directly to them and privately to them, there is no resolution, now come back and I'll see if I can help. But first, go directly and go privately. The next step is this. Begin with affirmation. We don't typically begin with affirmation. We typically begin with accusation. 
But here's what Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Affirm them. Affirm the relationship. Affirm what it is that you want to do, what you want to accomplish. See, we start off with accusing. We start off by justifying. We start off by attacking. And when you do that, the person you're going to, the person that there's some kind of tension with, the person there's some issue with, they are immediately put on the defensive. So what happens is it's as if there are two walls. And you're behind one wall, and they're behind the other, and there's this tension between you. And, and you're try, you want to resolve it, so you step out here. And you say, come over, let's talk. And as soon as they come over, you lob a hand grenade at them. You know what they're going to do? They're going to dive right back behind their wall and look for shelter. And then they're going to start lobbing hand grenades back at you. And that's what happens when you start with accusation, when you start by attacking. Instead, start with affirmation. Let your words not be abusive. Let them be good and helpful. Let them be encouraging. So let's say, for example, you have an issue with someone at work. It's, it's maybe a competition. You just constantly feel like you're competing with this person at work here's what you do you say hey can, can we grab a cup of coffee can we can we talk for a minute sure hey i just want you to know first of all i love the company we work for it's a great organization lie if you have to no <laughs> I, I i i value my job i like being employed here i appreciate the paycheck and i and i value you as a co-worker i, I appreciate what it is you contribute to our, to our organization. And I have a feeling that there's an issue between us. I don't know what it is. I'm not trying to make an issue. I'm trying to resolve one. I don't know what the problem is, but I want it to be dealt with. So I don't, I don't know where we start, but if I've done something to offend you, if I've bothered you in some way, if I've hurt you, I, I'd, I'd like to hear that so I can apologize. I'd like to hear what it is that, 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 that I've done. I want to I hear you. I want to give you a chance to, to share. And then listen. Let them communicate. My guess is if you start there, it will help bring you to a point of understanding. It will eliminate a lot of the tension. The next step is this. Monitor your mouth. So if beginning with affirmation is really about what you say, Monitoring your mouth is about how you say it. In Proverbs, it says it like this. A gentle answer deflects anger, but, a harsh, but harsh words make tempers flare. For something that was written thousands of years ago, that rings so true. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. So it's, it's how you say what it is you're saying with your words, with your body language. Listen to me. If you want to have a time to deal with an issue with somebody in your life, part of body language is eyeball to eyeball, looking at that person, not, yeah, you know, I know there's some tension here, but hold on, I'm almost finished with, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, what, what were you saying again? Yeah, that's not going to work. Put the phone away, engage. Monitor your mouth, how you say things. You know, you could say all the right words and say it harsh, critical, mean. And you've said all the right things, but the spirit behind it's all wrong. Believe me, I've been married for over 25 years. And my wife has told me, you know, everything you said I agreed with, but the way in which you said it, it hurt. And I'm going, well, I'm glad it wasn't recorded. Uh, no. I guarantee you, if you recorded all your conversations and you went back and listened, you'd be shocked at how you sound. You know the words you said, you'd be shocked at how you sound. Because so often we don't monitor our mouths. But more than that, monitoring your mouth is also how you communicate uh, certain things. So in other words, monitoring your mouth. Use certain statements. Use I feel statements. Or it seems, guys, I know it's like I feel statements, I feel nothing. I feel fine. I feel hungry. I feel full. That's about all I feel. So instead of I feel statements, think in terms of it seems to me statements. So you're, if you're a woman, you may use the I feel statements more, but they're interchangeable. 
So it might sound something like this. I feel like sometimes your job is more important than our relationship. It seems to me that sometimes you don't care about the situation that I'm facing. But don't just end there and say, I know it's not true, but that's how it seems. That's how it feels. You're not attacking. You're being gentle. And it's communicating. Now, what will happen is that person may say, wow, I never knew you felt like that. They may even say, wow, I can understand why it would seem that way to you. But regardless of how they respond, it may bring you to a point of understanding. So, monitor your mouth. The next is this. Look for what you own. And look hard for what you own. If there's tension in a relationship, I promise you this. 99% of the time, you own some, You have contributed something to that tension. I reserve 1% for complete innocence. 99% of the time, you've done something to contribute to that tension. In 1 John, it says this. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and are not living in the truth. If we claim we have not sinned against anyone, if we claim we've not damaged, if we claim we don't own anything that has contributed to this relational tension, we are fooling ourselves. We have to get to the point where we look and look hard at what do I own. It means instead of blaming, we own some stuff. See, because blaming only inflames the situation. It doesn't make it better. The reason this is so hard is because our emotions are involved. We're hurt. We're bothered. We're upset. We've been disappointed. And so we look and say, they did this. They said that. They, they behaved this way. And we, we don't look to, what is it that I own in this? What have I contributed to this? So you've got to learn to say, what do I own? And it means humbling yourself. You must humble yourself and admit you might have played a role in things. Maybe, just maybe, I own something in this situation. Maybe I didn't respond properly. Maybe I didn't have all the facts. Maybe I misinterpreted what they were trying to communicate. Maybe I overreacted. The reason it's so hard, who's ever had a muscle cramp? Okay, the deeper into the muscle that that cramp is, the more painful it is. So when it comes to relationships, the deeper the tension, the more we think we know all there is to know. So if the, the deeper the tension, the more we think we know everything. We know how it happened. We remember what was said, how it was said, why they said it, and what it was that they intended with what they said. We think we know it all. But when we humble ourselves, we go, maybe, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I overreacted. Maybe I wasn't giving grace in that moment. Look for what you own. It's hard. But I'm telling you, the deeper the tension, the more we think we know all there is to know. You're going to think you know it all. I'm promising you, you don't. You don't know everything that was happening in that moment in that person. I remember one time I was at a leadership meeting and someone was there and they, they responded in a way that was out of character. They, they overreacted, they were snarky, they were uh, almost um, angry. And it was very unlike them. And a lot of people on the leadership team were ready to just say, hey, that, that person, you know, let's just get rid of them. They don't, they don't need to be part of this. Turns out, conversation later, that the person had just been to the doctors and they, they thought they might have testicular cancer. And they were waiting for the results. And they, and they hadn't shared it with anyone. They were carrying that internally and it was eating them up. And so this frivolous statement that was made and that they overreacted to was understandable. doesn't make it right, but it was understandable. All of a sudden, you look deeper and you go, oh, okay, there's something else there. You don't necessarily know all there is to know. You just think you do. And the deeper the tension, the more you'll think that. So what do you own in it? How can you help bring resolution? The next is this. Establish specific ways to resolve things. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. 
Okay, you've, you've gone directly, you've gone privately, you've affirmed, you've monitored your mouth, you, you admit you own some things, and now, okay, great. It's resolved. It's been taken care of. Here's the problem. Who's ever been on the carousel of relational tension? It just keeps going around and around and around, and you never get off. You're just like, this is never going to end because you haven't established specific ways to resolve things. You've dissipated the tension, but what's causing the tension is still there. And so once those triggers happen, it just comes right back and you've got to deal with it again. So you're just doing this. That's not how God wants us to live. Here's how it says it in the Bible, in Hebrews. Work at living in peace with everyone. Work. Work at living in peace. It doesn't happen naturally. It's work. It's hard work. You have to invest in it. You have to ask questions. You have to put specific strategies in place. You have to be intentional. You have to say, hey, next time this happens, this is what we're going to agree to. Hey, next time I say this, before you jump to the conclusion, ask. So there are two great questions you can ask in order to begin to create concrete, specific ways in which to, bring resol- uh, to resolve the issue moving forward. The first question is this. How can we avoid this problem in the future? How can we avoid this in the future? What, what can I do different? How can I handle it different? What can I do different? The next is this. How can we improve our communication? Communication is the foundation of every healthy relationship. How can we improve our communication so that we don't have to keep having this issue over and over and over again? When you have those things mapped out, now you've got some specific ways in which to resolve things. And really, the last step is this. This is number seven. There is an eighth, which we'll get to. Reestablish the relationship. Here is where most of us fall short. We do the first six, and we don't do this. Have you ever had someone who has said to you, hey, you need, to, you need to deal with that relationship. You need to deal with that relationship. You need to deal with that relationship. And they, they do, they're doing it out of love. They're doing it out of grace. They're doing it out of compassion. They want to see your relationship resolved. And they say that to you. So you do the first six steps, but it's not really because you want to resolve the relationship. You want to shut the person up. So you do everything so you could say to them, I did what you asked, I dealt with it, now leave me alone. So in the Bible, there's this guy named Paul, one of the best, greatest, most influential apostles of his day. When he started his missionary work, he had a man with him by the name of Mark. His his ministry partner was Barnabas, but Barnabas had a nephew named Mark, and they all went together on this uh, mission trip. Partway through the mission trip, Mark gets homesick for mommy and leaves. I miss my mom, and he leaves them. Later on, they're going to go on another missionary trip. Barnabas says, hey, let's bring Mark with us. Paul says, not on your life. The guy's a mama's boy. He wasn't willing to stick it out. He's good for nothing. I don't want him with me. If he comes, you go. I'm not going. Relational tension. So much so that Barnabas goes his way and takes Mark. Paul goes his way and takes Titus and Timothy and Silas. And they go, and they separate Paul had no desire to reestablish his relationship with Mark. Years later, Paul is writing now to Timothy. He's nearing the end of his life, and this is what he says to Timothy. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Years earlier, he was good for nothing, worthless. I don't want him. He'll be helpful to me, and bring him with you reestablish the relationship. The goal isn't to go through the steps so you can tell people, stop bugging me. The goal is to go through the steps so that you can reestablish the relationship, that the relationship can move forward. It doesn't mean you're going to be best friends. It does mean you don't need to leave the church, leave the community, leave the marriage, leave the family, leave the job. It means you can be in community. God wants you to continue relationships, not end them. God's goal is for you to continue relationships, not end them. Therefore, you have to reestablish the relationship. How can we live together in harmony and grace and peace? See, a better life means reconciliation, not just resolution. 
A better, if you want a better life, it means reconciliation. Jesus said, first be reconciled to your brother, then come offer your gift. A better life means reconciliation, not just resolution. So often we fall short of that. So, what's the eighth step? Most of the time, these seven are all you need. But there are times when you've done everything you can do, and you have to take an eighth step. And this is rare. This is the last step, not the first step. So when you see this, don't start here. But here it is. If needed, step away. There are people who are cancerous. There are people who are dangerous. There are people who will threaten you and, and damage the people, other people in your life. And you've done everything you can do. You've gone to them. You've done all these other things, and they're not willing to engage. They're not willing to sit down. They're not willing to own anything. They keep acting aggressively, and they won't repent. There's no openness to anything. As a matter of fact, when you bring it up, they just get more angry. At that point, there are times when you need to simply step away. It's the last step. It's not the first step, and you should never, ever, ever take this step without first getting counsel from your pastor, from a counselor, from a trusted, mature Christian. Probably more than one. I would suggest multiple people. Get some counsel if you're going to do this because it impacts a lot of things. But there are times you need to step away. You need to say, I can't be part of this. In Titus, Paul writes this. Warn a quarrelsome person once or twice, but then be done with him. It's obvious that such a person is out of line, rebellious against God. By persisting in divisiveness, He cuts himself off. You're actually not stepping away. They are stepping away. They're going to make you feel guilty. They're going to say, well, this was your choice. No, no, no. You made the choice. You made this action. You did this. You behaved this way. The the choice was yours. This is the consequence of your choice. But they will twist it and say, you're choosing to do this. No, I'm not. By persisting in divisiveness, he cuts himself off. But that is the last step. And hopefully it's very rare, if at all, you have to take it. Because, as we said, a better life means reconciliation, not just resolution. Even if you have to step away, the goal is always to eventually come back to reconciliation. The goal is always to reestablish the relationship. You step away so that hopefully that person will change and the relationship can be reestablished. Would you stand with me in a closing prayer? We want better relationships, and it takes work. Some of you don't like these steps. Some of you don't want to take these steps. Some of you say the steps aren't necessary, but the Bible lays them out for a reason. It's how we do life. It's how we do relationships by God's design. And I'm telling you, because it's God's design, it will work. And if you take the first seven steps, it will almost always work, and you won't have to take the last one. And when you do, the hope is for reconciliation. I want to pray for you. We're all, every person is in a relationship. Different, but we're all in relationships. Therefore, I, I, I am certain we all have relational tension. I want to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that right now, by your Holy Spirit, by your grace, by your tender mercies, you would begin to soften our hearts. We've been wounded, we've been hurt, we've been angry, we've been carrying bitterness and resentment. God, whatever it is, and we've been unwilling to take these steps, either because we didn't know about them or we did and we didn't care. God, change us. Change us so that our relationships can be changed. Change us so that our lives can be better. Change us so that our relationships can be better. And some of the complexity of relationships can be removed because life is better when it's simple. And God, I'm praying that we would take serious your word. These steps It wouldn't just be nifty ideas, but they would be things we would put into practice. Oh, God, I can look back in my life. If I had done some of these things better back then, decades ago, it would have saved me a lot of strife. God, I can't change the past, but I can do things different from this day moving forward, and so can all of us. And so, God, I'm praying that we would do these things, do them well, so that our relationships could be better, our lives can be better, and that we would better reflect the loving kindness of you, our Heavenly Father. 
It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.